The Biophilic Leadership Summit is the only multi-day conference entirely dedicated to biophilic projects, principles, and research, bringing together the top industry leaders in an intimate, natural setting to network, build partnerships, and learn from each other. This year's summit will explore biophilic placemaking and how we can use biophilic principles to promote health, happiness, and vitality in public spaces. In addition to fascinating presentations, delicious farm-to-table meals at Serenby, and cocktails, this year's summer will feature a selection of biophilic experiences like forest bathing, bird watching, and more. So join us in Serenby for the 6th Annual Biophilic Leadership Summit from March 24th to March 26, 2024. Learn more about the summit and register today at biophilicsummit.com. That's biophilicsummit.com. We hope to see you there. Hey, Monica. Hey, Jennifer. Monica, tell us about our guest today. She's a very exciting expert on the benefits of nature for our mental health, and she's also a really good friend of ours. That is right. So today we're talking with Florence Williams. She's a journalist, author, podcaster, and her best-selling book, The Nature Fix, Why Nature Makes Us Happier, Healthier, and More Creative, uncovers the science behind why mental health benefits so strongly from time spent in the natural world. She's also the writer and host of two Gracie award-winning Audible original series. The first one's called Breasts Unbound, which I highly recommend, and then The Three Day Effect, as well as she's doing the podcast for Outside Magazine, Double X Factor. In her new book, Heartbreak, A Personal and Scientific Journey, Florence is now venturing into the wilderness to explore the emotion of heartbreak. And that book will be available for pre-order um, now and will be out early 2022, which we're looking forward to. I know. I can't wait for that one. This is such a great conversation with Florence. We really delve into the reasons why we feel so good after spending time outside, something I'm obviously very passionate about, and why sound is such an important but often overlooked aspect of our well-being. All right, so without further ado, let's get to our chat with Florence Williams. Well, hello, Florence. How are you? Hello, Jennifer. We're so excited to have you. I know. It's been so long. I was trying to think the last time the three of us were actually physically together. Was that April 2019, I think? Maybe? Uh, yes, or maybe even before that. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it, there's there's been a lot going on in the world. <laughs> a lot. I, uh, so happy to I, have you here, though. I think it was the at the end of the biophilic leadership conference. Oh, God, right. which is ages ago. Yes. Um, yes, Florence was our artist in residence um, and author who came and spoke about her book, which we're going to talk about today as well, called The Nature Fix. Um, among other things, we all became fast friends and can't get enough of each other. So we're thrilled to have you on today with us on Biophilic Solutions. It's great to be here. I have very fond memories of being productive. <laughs> <Like that artist's laughs> resident. And it, it was also, it was fun and productive. So it was good. Wonderful. Those are the best, the best trips. <laughs> um, so we're thrilled to have you here. Um, you sit within this wheelhouse of Jennifer's so much, but also everything that sort of we espouse at B, um at the Biophilic Institute. So kind of want to just like jump right in um, and you know, your book, The Nature Fix, has been out for quite some time now since 2017, and we'll dig into that a little bit. But I want to start off by like, how did you get interested in nature? Where did it all start? Uh, yeah, that's a good question, because it it seemed like an unlikely match at first. I mean, I, I grew up actually in New York City. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I loved Central Park. I loved Riverside Park. I grew up in between those two parks. It was the seventies. It was the eighties. You know, kids were sort of allowed to roam around on their own. I mean, I love cities, but I mm -hmm. also love nature. Mm -hmm. And actually my parents were divorced. And so, um, my dad had custody of me every summer and we would load up into this van, put canoes on the roof and wow. drive out West or drive down South. And we would spend like a month running rivers and camping in the van. Um, so I was very much this um, wilderness <laughs> slash mm -hmm. city girl. And I, I still am that, which is interesting. That's why I um, love you. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think we tend to find each other. We do, we do. I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> it's a great combo. No, so I, you know, and then um, after college, I, I, I got my first job 
in Colorado working for a newspaper in a small town in the Rockies. And I loved it. And I, and I, I didn't leave the Rockies again for, you know, 20, 20 years. Uh-huh. And so um, it just became part of my kind of daily DNA to go for walks in the woods and go for walks in the mountains and mm-hmm. go ski and, you know, go biking. And, uh, you know, I guess I, I just didn't even realize how much I needed that and appreciated it until my family moved to Washington, DC. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that happened in 2012. And that's when, you know, this kind of stress bomb, I would say exploded in my brain. You know, all of a sudden I was in this like big, noisy, you know, sort of gray city with all these traffic circles and <laughs> traffic jams. Mm-hmm. And I started to really think more about, you know, the ways that our external landscapes get reflected in our internal landscapes. Mm-hmm. And then at that exact moment that I moved outside magazine, approached me and said, can you write about the science of why we feel good being outside? And I was like, yes, Amazing. <laughs> because I am thinking a lot about that right now. Like what is, what is nature deficit disorder, you know, and, and is there science behind that idea? You know, it's not, it's not a diagnosis that's kind of officially recognized mm-hmm. by the medical community, but I think, you know, we can sort of understand what it means intuitively. And it turns out, you know, even in you know 2013, there was a lot of science going on. And of course, even more since then. Mm-hmm. When did uh, Richard Liu's book come out with that sort of first coinage of nature deficit disorder? I'm trying to remember. Yeah, it was actually 2006. Okay. So um, it was a while ago. Yeah. And you know, a ton had happened kind of in the academy, mm-hmm. looking at these questions. Uh, and, and actually, outside the academy, too, in in places like um, just clinical practices, um, you know, adventure programs, sports therapy, nature therapy, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff was, was sort of taking off on the clinical side, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a, a little bit and even more, of course, since, uh, since 2012, 13. Mm-hmm. I love that because I have to share with you really quickly is the fact that besides Richard Lube and diving into his work early on for myself, your book in 2017 was the first book that I really kind of dove into with like open eyes, being a New Yorker and loving nature. I really kind of, your book resonated so deeply with me. I remember sharing it with everyone saying, this is it. Like this is, this is the why we need to be outside. So your, your book really helped me get on that path of wanting to study more and wanting to learn more and, and find that science. Like you saw, like you noticed that there was science that was being developed and studied and shared. And so exponentially, so much more so since then. Yes. Mm-hmm. I'm so glad to hear that. That's great, Jennifer. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things in your book you talk about is the biophilia effect and obviously on biophilic solutions and being part of the Institute, like it's something that we're super passionate about. Um, and so I feel like you were an early um, spokesperson for it, if you will, by having, you know, thinking about it in the book. Can you tell us a little bit about how you define the biophilia effect? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, in the book, I was really trying to address the questions of Okay, once we f- have figured out, you know, through the science and and through anecdotes and elsewhere that nature does make us feel good, mm-hmm. you know, the, the interesting question is why, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, what's going on there? What is it about nature? What is it about our nervous systems? You know, that responds to that. And of course, it's it's really hard to figure that out. I, I don't think we have figured it out. It's a, a multifaceted mm-hmm. you know, answer. But I was really drawn to some of the theory you know, driving the research and the biophilic, you know, the biophilic hypo- biophilia hypothesis is really something that was popularized by the Harvard entomologist um, E.O. Wilson. And he looks a lot at, you know, human biological evolution and, and you know, evolutionary behavior. Uh, and, you know, what he has sort of articulated so clearly is that a- as an animal, humans have you know, evolved for 99% of our history outside. And so Mm -hmm. it it makes sense that our nervous systems are sort of aligned to the Mm -hmm. cues that we get in natural landscapes. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, our perceptual system, um, we know how to read a natural landscape subconsciously. We know how to look for things that are life-giving and, um, you know, generative and restorative 
we know how to see that you know blue water means safety and that green trees mean you know um fruit <laughs> and mm-hmm. things like that and and also safety mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. refuge sort of this idea right. of res- refuge and prospect sure. that mm-hmm. you know we we descended you know from from apes you know we still have this kind of arboreal you know instinct alive and well in us mm-hmm. um, you know, many of us feel um, safe, not everybody, because culture, of course, you know, has factored into sort of which landscapes really sing to us, you know, on mm-hmm. an emotional level. But um, so, you see, the biophilic hypothesis is really that we have this innate affinity for living things. It's just wired into our brains and our nervous systems, even on a, this very subconscious level. And so that when we go outside in a, in a pleasant, you know, natural environment, we feel sort of at home there, mm-hmm. um, even if we can't really articulate why. And so, you know, at the end of a day of spending a lot of time outside, you know, we may feel just calmer mm-hmm. and we feel, f- may feel more relaxed. Our energy reserves, you know, are not completely depleted in in the way that they are when we spend a day in the city, you know, mm-hmm. or in the office. And I think it's so interesting about, about our nervous systems. You know, when, when we're in a city, even though we may feel like, oh, this is alive and I feel vital here and it's it's juicy and great. Mm-hmm. Our brains are actually working really hard to filter out all the mm-hmm. stimulation. We can only take in so much. And so, you know, if you think about it, when you're crossing an intersection, you know, on Broadway <laughs> or whatever, mm-hmm. like you have to focus in on some things. You have to focus in on the taxi cab that's like careening towards you, but you're not <laughs> yes. going to be necessarily noticing the clouds in that particular mm-hmm. moment or, you know, a noxious smell you know, from a garbage can, you know, we're, we're just filtering out so much so that we can focus on what we need to focus on. And, and that act of filtration is actually really taxing. It's exhausting. And so at the end of the day, we're sort of grumpy and we don't even really know why. Right. Uh, right. I love that because you're right. It's our nervous system really trying to find that balance of protecting ourselves from that environment when we're supposed to be outside. But I think that's really interesting that you've also talked about is this, um, you know, we reap that benefits of being outdoors in nature, even if we don't enjoy the time being outside of nature. Can you elaborate right. a little bit on that? Sure. Yeah. I was interested in studies um, that measured things like, you know, cognitive load and attention span, um, you know, when people go for walks outside, you know, and mm-hmm. it's pretty well established that that actually we do perform better on tests. Our, our working memory is better. Our attention span is better after we, you know, take this little sort of break by being outside and letting our kind of sensory brains kick in and our Mm -hmm. cognitive brains sort of dial down for a little while, like even 30 or 40 minutes. But um, the interesting thing is that even when people take those studies, they, they, they do the cognitive studies after being in a miserable, (laughs) you know, sort of climate environment or miserable weather where Mm -hmm. like in Michigan, there was a study, you know, and it was winter and it was windy and nobody really wanted to go out um, but you know, the amazing thing is when they got back into the lab and took those tests, they still performed just as well, you know, as if it had been a nice day. So it's sort of good for us. It's like, you know, it's like the broccoli problem. Right? <laughs> yeah. It may not yeah. be the first thing to grab in the cupboard or yeah. in the refrigerator. Um, but it's good for us. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. We we had like a group of women um here at Serenby that um, you know, in the winter, we were trying to walk every weekend just to get out, right? It's sort of we were still in the depth of the pandemic and quote unquote lockdown, but felt like we could all walk outside safely. And I remember one day it was pretty much pouring rain and we all decided to still do the walk and we just sort of geared up, right? We got right. the boots on and the raincoats. Um and went out and it was, we were just dressed properly and it kind of was amazing. Yes. Even though, right. And so I, I I hold that like experience so close to my heart because I didn't really want to go out, but I loved these women. And so, and, you know, obviously it sort of became this great experience, even though again, the inclement weather or, you know, oh, you don't go out in the rain, but it's just water. So it, it's changing <laughs> your mindset a little bit and having that incentive. And for me, it was, it was this group of women that got me out. Right. But I, I have a couple of tips about that. I mean, yeah. one is that, um, you know, I love a good hood. Mm-hmm. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> absolutely. Um, uh, you know, outer, I believe in outerwear and with yep. a good hood, <laughs> you know, you don't, that the wind isn't quite as, um, you know, annoying. Right? Yep. Um, 
And in fact, you can feel pretty protected and, um, you know, it's just, you don't have the annoyance of the wind. Yeah. Uh, and then the other is I, I have, I, I believe in this sort of 15 minute effect, which is that, um, you know, mostly as humans, we have trouble with the transitions, you know, yes. it's sort of like going from the warm couch <laughs> yes, and the bowl of popcorn, you know, out into the bad weather. But, but once you're out for 15 minutes, right, that's kind of the magic mm-hmm. number. Then we're like, oh my God, it's great out here. I don't even want to go back. Yeah. yeah. And so we just keep going. Yep. And so I feel like, you know, if, if you can just get yourself out there for 15 minutes, then you get over the hump and you start to actually really love it out there. Well, I love the thing. I believe in good outer wear. <laughs> that really is it. It's not bad weather. It's bad <laughs> clothing. Right? That's right. That's right. But I, I, but I will say there is a caveat, Monica, to this that I'm really feeling a lot this summer. Yeah. And I think probably a lot of people are, which is that, you know, the smoke, the smoke and the heat, mm. you know, we are in a climate, a bit of a climate yeah. apocalypse, it feels yeah. like. And, yeah. and that is one time where it really does not feel good mm-hmm. to be outside. You know, when it's that hot, it's that smoky, you know, our, our, also our nervous systems are really primed to freak out, you know, when the air is filled with smoke. Sure. And so, um, that's when it doesn't feel safe and it doesn't feel helpful. Um, and unfortunately, you know, it feels like we are sort of ever launching into a world, um, you know, that's going to have these challenges in it, you know, which is also why when it is nice out, we need to take advantage of that and sort of renew our, um, you know, our energy to be Mm -hmm. activists and, um, you know, to kind of, um, find enough personal restoration, you know, that we can sort of go back into making the world a better place because that's Mm -hmm. what we have to do. Yeah, no. And I, and I think, um, a big part of, and I feel like this was either maybe in an article you wrote or in the book, but, you know, um, I think you made a comment about like, you know, we, as a, as a whatever society kind of devalue nature mm-hmm. potentially because we don't spend enough time in it. Um, or we think that we have to go to Yosemite to get the experience that we need, right. That really it is mm-hmm. in, um, you know, your Piedmont park here in Atlanta or central park or Riverside park. Like you can get that experience mm-hmm. there or just a fabulous tree line street, mm-hmm. but obviously we need the climate to cooperate, um, and not have smoke in 110 degree days, right. which is a whole nother, um, conversation. But I do think the first step, um, in order to say that, like, we need to protect this or, you know, keep the degrees down, et cetera, et cetera is to value. Add. Yeah. And value it. Absolutely. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, and value ourselves too, and know that mm-hmm. if we're suffering from burnout mm-hmm. and we're stressed out, mm-hmm. um, you know, sort of works both ways, you know, we can help nature by being outside, but nature can help us kind of get into the frame of mind where we want to be generous. Well, well uh, and talk about that. Cause there's two sides of it. The year, a lot of your study and work has been around happiness um, and you did really do some cool experiments um, on yourself as well as, the, you know, pull it into the book. So talk about that a little bit. And then I'd love you to touch on, you were about to start talking, I think about awe, mm. um, but I'd love to hear like some of the happiness research um, that you've done, like choose any of it. I mean, there's so many great ones. I love the way you put the, the hood, on, the head, uh, the helmet that had all the right. sensors on it, but like. Tell me about some of the stuff, because I think that's what we also need to realize is um, it affects our nervous system and and it can have some real negative impacts down the line, mm-hmm. um, whether that's noise pollution, but talk, talk a little bit about happiness. Sure. Yeah. You know, as a science journalist, I want to make the science really accessible mm-hmm. yeah. and um, I, I do that sometimes by being personal um, by, you know, sometimes being um, incorporating some humor you know, I want to sort of guide my readers along. And so I do sometimes in my books use myself, (laughs) you know, as kind of a proxy for some of the science Mm -hmm. that's going on. And so um, one of the experiments I did for this book, as you mentioned, was I put on this kind of helmet, Mm -hmm. which is a um, EEG, portable EEG cap um, Mm -hmm. for electroencephalography, and it measures brain waves. (laughs) And so I wore that in different environments. I wore it on city streets. I wore it in city parks. Um, I wore it deep into the wilderness. 
And, um, and then, you know, various um, algorithms would sort of analyze the data mm-hmm. to say, oh, yes, you, you achieved an alpha state, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just kind of a desirable brain okay. state, or, um, you know, you, you dial down some of your cognitive load in your prefrontal cortex, mm-hmm. um, which is also something that you kind of want to see because it means that you're resting your mm-hmm. thinking brain. Um, And then allowing other more maybe introspective or creative or sensory parts of your brain to come online. Um, And so, you know, one of the things we were looking for was alpha waves. And I was not able to achieve alpha waves Hmm. um, in a city park, although, you know, there are other benefits to being in a city park. But but that sort of like real sort of calm alert phase didn't didn't turn on for me, Hmm. but it did turn on when I was on a lake in Maine in the middle of nowhere and I couldn't hear human sounds. Mm -hmm. Uh, And also when I was, uh, you know, sort of deep in the wilderness in Montana, um, I was able to get those, those, those brainwave states. Um, And I know from the book and from my research too, that I am someone who's very sensitive to human Mm -hmm. noise, okay, like airplanes (laughs) and, you know, traffic. Those things really annoy me. <laughs> Some people, I think, can kind of, you know, um, filter them out better. Yeah. Um, although, you know, studies have shown that even when we're asleep at night and we think we're sleeping through these sounds, our nervous systems are actually responding. Hmm. But, you know, and so a little bit of, you know, cortisol or stress hormones might get released even when we're asleep, when an airplane flies overhead, which hmm. is why um, probably... Um, people who live under the flight paths of major urban airports, uh, like in places like um, Germany, where these studies have been done, um, actually have higher rates of cardiovascular disease, anxiety medication. Um, There are learning decrements associated with schools that are under these flight paths. So even when we think we adjust these noises, um, our bodies are actually processing them in, you know, kind of a threat based way. That's incredible. Fascinating. Yeah. You know that. Yeah. Yeah. Noise pollution is a, is a much, it's, it's kind of a sign. Well, <laughs> it's a, it's a silent threat. I mean, that's an, it's, it's, an, <laughs> right. it's an invisible threat, I would say. Right. So not just the planes overhead, but what other, would you think are the noise things that we don't think about that are actually affecting our health? Um, because we know that sounds of nature, like bird sounds and a waterfall and, and ocean water and crackling leaves are really good for us. But what are the other things that we should be thinking about when we're indoors or walking down the street that might be affecting our overall health? Well, you know, the, I mean, I've talked about the sort of the, um, the negative side of human sounds. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are, as you mentioned, a lot of positive benefits Mm -hmm. of nature sounds. And Mm so if you can walk on a street that has more trees, you know, you're going to hear more birds and also Mm -hmm. some of the traffic sounds might be muffled. Mm -hmm. Um, if there are parks in your city that are quieter than other parks, mm-hmm. you know, by all means, if you're after stress reduction, um, then you might want to head for those parks. Um, you might want to take a break, you know, from a busy day by being someplace quiet. Mm-hmm. Very helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you, like, like I do, if you <laughs> work in a city that's under a flight path, I'm under the flight path of Reagan National Airport, mm. you know, you might want to think about, um, you know, wearing noise canceling headphones or piping in bird sounds, ah. um, you know, into your sort of work morning or into your routine. There's some really interesting studies showing that schools or the classrooms that pipe in bird song in the afternoon, as opposed to classrooms that don't, um, the classrooms that have the bird song, the kids are sort of more, they're paying more attention. They're more ah. alert. They're a little more relaxed. Wow. But it will, yeah. Good to know. Um, well, <laughs> and also I, views, you know, views out, it's outside or mm-hmm. of trees, you know, there, there are lots of ways you can try to tap into these benefits of nature, mm-hmm. even from a city and from mm-hmm. your house or apartment. You're going to yeah, we had, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm just going to okay, one quick go. thing because just touching on that, because I live in New York city and I get to see, you know, people, the flights coming in for, to LaGuardia and JFK. But since COVID, I started putting um, 
uh, bird seed on my windowsill. So now all the doves go all day long and I hear wow. them doing, and it's really, really funny because my mom just visited the past few days and she's like, oh my gosh, I can hear doves on your windowsill. I'm like, I know, isn't it cool? So now I have these doves just living on my windowsill and it's just like, it's been. Wow. What a great idea. 11, 11 floors up. I never knew that that would actually happen, but it's been absolutely delightful. Oh, wow. That's much better than piping it into your app. I, know. <laughs> I do that sometimes too at night. But side note. Side note. Sorry, Monica, go ahead. No, 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 no. I was going to say that, um, you know, biophilic design, we had Bill Browning on, um, who you know of, and, um, you know, it is fascinating of what you can do from an interior design perspective to bring nature inside that's beneficial. And he had some really interesting school studies as well of what um, could help the kids be more focused. Um, I think, you know, paying attention, you know, I think some of them even did better on tests. Right. Um, exactly. Exactly. That's right. Mm-hmm. And they, they healed better, you know, from medical problems. Mm-hmm. But I also, I have tips for people who are going out outside too on short yeah. walks you know if you're in a city um just it seems like from the japanese research into forest bathing for mm-hmm. example that um the more we can wake up our sensory brains mm-hmm. the more restorative our experience will be and in a shorter period of time so mm-hmm. you know we can go outside and you know listen to a, a podcast or you know be thinking about our to-do list right we all do that but right. the more you can actually try to um, locate yourself in, you know, time and space in the present moment. Um, you know, we know from the mindfulness research, right, that that's really, that's really great. Mm-hmm. So um, to tap into our sensory brains, I suggest doing things like, um, you know, looking for fractal patterns, for mm-hmm. example, you know, mm-hmm. in the landscape where you're walking, looking at patterns that you might find in, in flower blooms or, mm-hmm. in, um, you know, tree limbs um, in bark, um, in clouds, you can always look up, right. Even when you're in a city, mm-hmm. um, and then, you know, trying to also key into bird song, you know, yeah. what birds are you hearing? Where, mm-hmm. Where's the sound coming from? Do some sounds of nature feel farther away or some closer? Uh, and then I love to sort of grab, um, especially evergreen needles, you know, off of landscaping yep, yep, <laughs> or yep. I mean, a wild tree is great, but you know, if it's going to be a shrub, from my neighbor's um, yard that works too, you know, and I, I really take a deep inhale of that, those wonderful smells and, and that puts your brain emotionally in a different place really, really quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I think about that, like lavender or basil yes. or rosemary, something that you can smell. And Jennifer, what really, I remember really struck me is when we first met, you were telling me, you know, you do these guided nature walks and you were fascinated that one of the things that people love the most was when you said, touch something, <laughs> you know, pick something up and touch a plant. And they were like, what? what? <laughs> <laughs> it's right. Because we just yeah. Don't, we just don't do it. And so thinking exactly. about activating those senses is such a great tip. Mm-hmm. It really, it really is amazing how that sort of puts us into our bodies. Mm-hmm. Uh, it embodies us, which is so good for our mental health. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and it's something that we, you know, we're typically sort of sensory deprived mm-hmm. you know, when we're when we're at our desks all day. Um, ah. And so it's, it's, that's a wonderful idea, Jennifer. Well, you say yeah. like what you, you always talk about, like being in nature or being with nature makes us more human. You know, like you had just said about this, we've been so disconnected from the natural world and we made it normal for so long that now reconnecting everyone said, oh, wow, then it's OK. Like we're giving ourselves permission to love being in touch with nature, which I think is right. Awesome. And to and to be our full embodied mm. animal selves, you know, I also say I say that um, nature is good for civilization mm. because it does make us calmer and more generous. Uh, and, and we know this from some really interesting awe studies that mm-hmm. when we perceive something really beautiful, it takes us outside of our kind of individual, you know, dramas and makes us feel connected to mm-hmm. the world around us and which also makes us feel connected to each other. So yeah. we'd be more inclined to sort of act in pro-social ways um, to help each other. And, and studies have really shown that. Yeah. Th- um, there, there, right, is a study that shows that when you experience awe in nature, you are actually kinder and more generous after yes. that experience, which 
Mm-hmm. It's pretty mind blowing to me. Yeah, I know. I know that was a surprise to me too. I didn't think nature would actually necessarily, um, you know, make us nicer people, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or, or make us, um, you know, give away more money to charity, things like that. And there are actually a bunch of studies that show that also we tend to perceive our own physical bodies as being smaller <laughs> and our own problems as being a little bit less okay. you know, consuming. Sure. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we feel more that we're part of the world and boy, do we need to feel that right now, mm-hmm. right? When these problems that are confronting us really demand sort of cooperation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, as we're recording this, the IPCC, right, report, the newest one came out, I think, yesterday, and it's kind of, you know, touched off a whole emotional firestorm of questions and thoughts that, like, we've really baked in kind of one and a half, possibly two degrees and sort of for the next 30 years, like, this is what's going to happen. But, you know, with, with cooperation, we can affect what's going to happen after those 30 years. Um, And so I'm really hoping that this can be a potential wake up call to all of us. I mean, obviously we're already in that place and our goal is to share that information with people and get them to, you know, find a way in and, you know, one way in maybe reading your book, right. Um, Or even an article you've written or listening to an episode. Um, But tell us a little bit more about, you know, what you're working on today, because you're doing some really interesting things, including your own podcast. Yeah, I I have made several podcasts. Uh, and most recently this summer, I've been working on a little series for Outside Magazine that we're calling The Summer of Love, which is about how sort of our human relationships get really amplified and catalyzed by time outside. Uh, and I have a kind of related book uh, coming out really soon. It's already mm-hmm. available for pre-order. Oh, and it's great. actually about It's about heartbreak. Um, And it's called Heartbreak, um, A Personal and Scientific Journey. Um, People can find out more about that on my website, uh, which is just florencewilliams.com. You can sign up for a newsletter. Um, That book's coming out in a few months. But, um, you know, one of the things I look at is how nature can help us heal from grief Mm -hmm. and heal from trauma Mm -hmm. and how it can be kind of an antidote to loneliness too. So -hmm. in the nature fix, I, I, I sort of look at nature, I look at a dose curve of nature, Mm -hmm. starting from sort of nearby nature to like three days in the wilderness. I talk about the three day effect. And I do have a podcast called that also that we just pull out kind of that section. Um, But in this new book, I, I look at what happens after like 14 days after 30 days. (laughs) Oh, wow. Okay, great. And it's also very, it's a personal, you know, journey for me. So that's so exciting. Well, we'll put that in our show notes for sure. So tell us a little bit about the three day, three day effect and then what the difference there is between these sort of 14 and 30, because some of our listeners may be like, Ooh, three days is too long. How am I going to achieve 14 and 30? So like, what does that mean? What do I need to do? Do I have to be camping that whole time in the middle of nowhere or what, what, what do I need to do? Um, I'm not sure the science kind of breaks down the like exact, um, you know, sort of recommendations. Um, the studies looking at the three day effect, uh, really a lot of them come out of Utah. I spent mm-hmm. a lot of time in the nature books talking to a particular cognitive neuroscientist named David mm-hmm. Strayer. And he studies people who go on backpacking trips and people who mm-hmm. uh, go on river trips and, um, Actually, the research was corroborated by a study in Minnesota, also looking at canoeists. So, so these are really people who are um, are sleeping outside, mm-hmm. you know, having sort of a, a full three day immersion. And and what Dr. Strayer kind of noticed, and and then what he's kind of verified in the research is that um, big changes happen in our brains after three days outside, Mm -hmm. you know, we, we start to sort of separate from the human world a little bit Mm -hmm. and uh, our sense, our sensory brains just really come online. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we notice things by the third day that we wouldn't have noticed the first day. Mm -hmm. Um, We, we see things we wouldn't have seen. We hear things we wouldn't have heard. Um, And, and when that happens, you know, the blood flow is really changing <laughs> into yeah. different, different pathways, different parts of our brains. Um, there's another theory that, that is not Strayer's, but um, someone else's that after three days, our dreaming mm-hmm. 
starts to sort of reference we when, when we dream we only reference like a world that's kind of three days old or something or even when we're daydreaming and so if we've been in nature for three days we start to our dreams start to take place in nature <laughs> more and um I thought that was really interesting, you know, and, 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 you know, of course, a lot of traditions and cultures across time have used these nature immersions as rites of passage, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like, because there are really profound shifts in our thinking about ourselves, in our thinking about our place in society, mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. we are. Um, and again, if we, if we are dealing with grief or trauma, we need to confront mm -hmm. those, those really big questions. And we need to have the kind of time and space and a calmer nervous system that will allow those big thoughts um, to happen. Mm -hmm. And so you, so I think we're, you know, we're seeing more wilderness therapy, which is really interesting and has been so helpful for a lot of people. It takes us out of our kind of ruts and patterns mm -hmm. and helps us kind of rearrange the furniture in our, in our brains a little bit. Yeah. When did I like you start that. really studying that that effect of awe? Like, was that initially right off the bat that you really recognized awe, or is that something you kind of discovered through your your studies and your writing and your reading? Yeah, I think it was really uh, through the writing of the Nature Fix, um, where I I came across some of those studies and um, started talking to some researchers who have figured out different ways different ways to study awe. It's kind of, it, it, it's, it's been an underappreciated emotion. Uh -huh. You know, we have a bunch of positive emotions um, and awe was one that was kind of less studied than some others. And of course, for a long time, psychologists and experimental psychologists were really focusing on the negative emotions. Uh -huh. So it's only been so, even sort of recently that we've been looking at the benefits of positive emotions and awe has been just late to the party. <laughs> um, but it's such a, a uniquely kind of human emotion and and the fact that it does bind us to each other yeah. is really interesting because it suggests that perhaps it has been a critical emotion for mm -hmm. human evolution because it has helped keep us in community mm -hmm. and has helped keep us you know sort of caring about each other and that's why you know even like so many religions you know including prehistoric religions you know really incorporated um you know, elements of awe mm -hmm. and, um, you know, the cosmos, right. Things that make us feel small mm -hmm. and humans are, I think, sort of unique probably in tapping into that. Well, and even, I think, um, as you, as you talk about religion, I think about, you know, um, some of these incredible architectural cathedrals, yeah, oh. right. That are, that are Gothic. And so not modern, but but that may, I wonder if that's sort of what they were going for when you walk into one with the size and the flying buttresses and the stained glass windows. Sure. I think there are lots of ways that we access awe. You know, it's mm -hmm. not just nature, although, mm -hmm. although the studies seem to, seem to show that for, for most of us these days, about half the time we experience awe, it's in the natural world. Mm -hmm. But we also experience it from, you know, museums or listening to a symphony yeah. or, um, you know, watching the birth of a baby, right? Yeah. Or, um, or maybe seeing someone famous, <laughs> <laughs> you know, can fill us with awe to a certain mm -hmm. extent. You know, politicians, of course, have really kind of man manipulated those emotions. Mm -hmm. um, in big, large rallies, you know, where we maybe feel the power of sort of awe that mm -hmm. way, um, where we have this sort of collective experience of awe, you know, the pyramids, right? I mean, there are all these ways that that political leaders and, and governments and um, religious leaders have, you know, in, in some ways manipulated those feelings to kind of make us think a certain way, right. a certain way you know, in, in unison. Uh-huh. No, I love that. Um, and I think that, um, you know, the wilderness therapy, I think that's a really interesting thing. And it sort of has all clicked for me having this conversation um, that that those three days of it's almost like going out and having a reset. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. And there's mm -hmm. a circadian reset too, of course, that happens yes. when you're just exposed to natural mm -hmm. light and darkness. Yeah. P people sleep on average an hour more outside mm -hmm. after three days. And, um, and, and that benefit lasts for about a week of that kind of circadian reset. Interesting. And there are ways that we can, I think, try to engineer that a little bit in our, you know, normal lives too, mm -hmm. by going for walks early in the morning and also at night. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Um, I find that when I, I have a dog, you know, when I walk her after dinner and it's dark out, or I watch the sunset, which I have been doing all through the pandemic, um, I sleep better. Yeah. I can understand that. I can, yeah. yeah. Especially being in the tent all summer, I can definitely understand that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know last summer you, that experience for you, Jennifer, cause you were really there the whole time. Changed me for sure. So everything mm-hmm. you're saying, Florence is like, it's so hitting home to me because spending last summer, three, three months living outdoors in a tent wow. and, and didn't go inside. I didn't go inside for three months. So it was <laughs> yeah. Really- so what else did you yeah, notice know. Jennifer? What else? Everything. What else did you like it was yeah. really a trans transformative experience, like rising with the sun and swimming with the sunrise. Uh, mm-hmm. I just feel wow. like this etherealness of space and place that I'd never, ever experienced. But what you're saying is just like hitting my heart in such a powerful way because it is so deeply ingrained within us to feel this connection to one another through nature. And you're, yes. you know, you're talking about it. And it's, it just makes my heart swell with just excitement and love and you know, empathy for those who cannot um, mm-hmm. get outdoors mm-hmm. for multiple right. reasons. And for all the kids, yes. you know, who don't have this kind of gift in their toolbox that they can yeah. draw upon, you know, as, as they face challenging times. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. really passionate about getting kids outside and getting them connected. Um, I think they need it. I think our planet needs it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tell me, um, I mean, I, I, I think we've seen the trends over the past sort of 18 months with the pandemic of people really wanting to find space in nature and, um, you know, getting outside in whatever way that might be, whether that was changing houses or fleeing the city for the moment. Um, but what trends are you seeing positively that we can sort of look to and help amplify? Mm. I, I do think as hard as the pandemic has been, one silver lining has been that people are thinking more about their mental health. Mm-hmm. They're talking mm-hmm. more about mm-hmm. their mental health mm-hmm. um, and they're paying attention mm-hmm. to how they feel. So when they do go outside, and of course, you know, I think you'd have to be under a rock right now not to be seeing um, lots of, you know, stories about the benefits of being outside. When they do go outside, maybe they're paying a little bit more attention mm-hmm. to how they feel afterwards. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people are really finding it fantastic after being kind of cooped up <laughs> yeah. and being on, on Zoom calls all day, yeah. that that they need this balance in their lives of something authentic and something sensory-based to have this kind of um, just more balanced, you know, sort of diet of, of media and stimulation in their lives. Um, I think that people have felt um, safer outside, you know, than mm. inside, and that that's mm-hmm. also been remarkable. You know, I, when I wrote the nature fix, I really thought it was kind of an obvious thesis. You know, <laughs> I was like, well, duh, of course being outside makes us feel better. You know, don't, don't people already know this? Like nobody's really going to care, but I can't tell you how many like emails I get from people saying, well, I read your book and now I go outside. Right. And I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> so, so there were a lot of people not going outside. And now I hope that there are more, you know, especially after all we've been through this year, you know, I just think there's a ton of momentum here. Um, there aren't a lot of other things we can do that make us feel better. Mm-hmm. We can't necessarily go travel to see our families or, you know, go to the concerts and the symphonies and experience these sort of cultural, mm-hmm. yeah. cultural things. And so, so I think nature has like really kind of risen to the top. I think the question is, you know, whether it, it, uh, it sticks. <laughs> right. I think we have to make it stick. Yeah. I think, I think that's our role, uh, you know, personally, I think all of our role is to continue yep. to talk about it. And, and again, everybody's going to enter it from a different direction. Right. Mm-hmm. And so which data point or information source or, you know, is going to drive them to do it, it's going to be totally different. And I think that's the thing that we all need to just keep doing it, even if we think it's so obvious to us. Yeah. Yes. Um, keep sort of, um, preaching if you will. 
Yeah. Well, I think that's why the work you both are doing is so important. And I'm really grateful that you're doing it. Oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> it, it, we enjoy it. And we were like, we've been talking about how thrilled we are uh, to have you on today. Yes. Um, as we wrap up, um, is there anything else you want to share? I mean, definitely. I think we all need to pre-order your book. We're going to put that in the show notes. I'm <laughs> also going to link to your three-day effect um, podcast, which is more like an audio. Was that, re- was that a few years ago? The three day of was that two years ago? Uh, I think it was about two years ago. Yeah. We did it right after the yeah. book came out. It was great. Yeah. I loved it. It's so you. very like of a N- NPR kind of feeling. Like I felt I wasn't expecting it when I downloaded, I said, Oh my gosh, this is really, I'm hearing the people speak, you know, in real life. And it was, it was really good. So I loved it really. Loved well, it's it. fun because we really take groups of people out into the nature and we do these tests on them. Yeah. <laughs> like we, we measure their nervous systems was, in different yeah. environments. Like and so there. it was really fun. Yeah. 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 It was fun. Yeah. It kind of brings the book to life. Um, and then uh, the outside series is phenomenal. Um, I've listened to a few of them. I just haven't been in the car as much as usually where I listen to my podcast, but I did especially love the one about, was it the two climbers relationship yes. was yeah, so Jordan wonderful. Yeah, the older you. and younger climber. Yeah. Yeah. We, I don't just look at romantic relationships in that series. You know, I look at, um, you know, friendships yeah. and, um, yeah, different things. Yeah, I, I took it as summer of love of just getting outside. Love of <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, but, um, Florence, we are thrilled to call you our friend. We're thrilled about the work that you're doing out there and, um, anything we can do to Support. to share and amplify oh, our wonderful. pleasure. Well, back at you. I'm very appreciative uh, of you both. And, um, thank you so much for having me on today. Oh, thank you. Okay. So what are your thoughts on our chat? What were your big takeaways, Jennifer? Okay. Well, I love her so much. She's so full of so much wealth of information, but I love that there are benefits even in the dead of winter. For example, if you venture outside for a 20 minute walk in winter, it may not be the most mindful experience per se. And we might be thinking about how cold we are, but we still receive benefits. The other thing is the science behind the sound and the effects of different types of sounds on our well-being. Right. We become so used to those sort of man-made and city life sounds that we really don't fully recognize the effect they're having on us. So like, let's say you're working at home and all of a sudden somebody starts jackhammering the sidewalk right outside your window. We might jump and realize what's happening and feel irritated. But from an evolutionary perspective, we're going into a complete uh, flight or fight mode. And over time, these things have an effect on our overall health and our rates of anxiety. It's so incredible, isn't it? And then on the flip side, sounds of nature like birds and running water have this soothing, calming effect on us. It's really, really fascinating. I know. That's probably why I choose that uh, Apple phone birds chirping in the morning. (laughs) Um, And of course, we talked about awe. So we're kind of coming full circle from our conversation with Phil Tab all the way back to episode one. Florence reiterates how feelings of awe produce these really pro-social emotions like generosity and creates this feeling that you're a small part of a massive world and universe. And I would also make the argument that these things really help us build a thriving society. My other takeaway, and I'm not joking, kind of joking, is really get yourself some great outerwear. (laughs) No, it's so true. It's really not a joke. Right. Like, think about how more appealing it is to go out in the rain if you've got some great boots and a really good hooded rain jacket. Exactly. I mean, I do it all the time, especially in New York. Or for the winter, a big poofy winter jacket and great hat make all the difference. It's there to sound silly, but it's actually pretty important and so practical. I mean, layers are so important. That's right. I'm off to pursue the Patagonia website. (laughs) Bye, Monica. Bye, Jennifer.